Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, we are in for a treat. Um, the subject tonight is strengthening community. And uh, heaven knows we have a lot of work to do um, in the broad community and even here on our campus and in our school. Um, the particular uh, angle that we're, we've asked our speakers to address tonight is how diversity and inclusion uh, can both define and strengthen our community. Um, these are strange times, uh, but it's safe to say when it comes to race and identity in this country, we've had a lot of strange times for a long time. So it, it is not unique what we're going through right now, but I think there are some elements that uh, give extra pause for what's happening right now. Uh, we couldn't be happier to have Dr. Jason Nichols join us tonight. Uh, Dr. Nichols is a lecturer in the Department of African American Studies. Um, I learned only in the course of preparing for my introduction that he does a lot more than just lecture. Uh, he is a rap artist and uh, <laughs> goes under uh, the name Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I will tell you, I, the only part that I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uh, sorry to have to provide that part of the introduction is it raises the bar way high for academics like me that cannot claim such interesting pursuits outside the classroom. Um, uh, I did want to uh, uh, introduce, even though I think everyone here knows, Corrine Paul. Uh, Corrine is going to be our moderator tonight uh, for Dr. Nichols. And yeah, <laughs> give it up for Corrine. Um, Corrine is focusing on international development, has done uh, internships in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and here at the SAFE Center focusing on uh, human trafficking. Uh, that's a pretty broad range of interests for uh, a woman ha who has uh, great range on all uh, kinds of issues. Um, but tonight, I, I want to introduce her as Madam President because she is the uh, founding president of the Black uh, Student, Public Policy Students, uh, Black Association, no. Black Students in Public Policy. Be <laughs> So, I would like to welcome Dr. Nichols and Madam President to the stage. It's uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for inviting me and, and uh, thank Megan and Chandrika and Corrine and of course the Dean for, for having me here. Um, so this is a really interesting topic for me. Uh, I thought he was going to bring up some of my public intellectual work. <laughs> but I believe that hip hop is, is public intellectual work. And uh, it's, you know, I'm very proud of the work that I've done in, in, in the music industry. Uh, I'm just not proud of the amount of money that I made <laughs> or did not make. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to share you, with you uh, a little bit about some of the experiences that I've had recently. Uh, coming from some of my public intellectual work. So uh, I thought that, you know, I would share with you some of the things that I hear from my fans. Uh, so no children in here? Small children? Okay, good. Fuck off, you little, lo you loser little fucktard. Hope your whole family dies a horrible death. I curse your family. Fucking puke-faced little bitch punk motherfucker. You want to come after white people? Here I am, you fucktard. Come take your shot at the title. I got something for you. You want to rid... Oh, some of these grammatically are not very good, so I'll just tell you. You want to rid the national anthem? We will get rid of your black ass. Professor Nichols. I just saw a rebroadcast of Tucker on Fox where you were his guest, and I felt, necessary, I felt it necessary to write you and simply say, you are what's wrong with America. 
And further, the African Americans lost more in the fight when you speak and peddle your racist dogma. What an embarrassment you are. You need to stop and allow people to rise above the past irregardless <laughs> of where they've been. It's a new day and you spewed your, spewed your garbage is the opposite of what the black community needs to progress. You need to stop. I felt I had to share this with you, sir. God bless you, Pastor Rogers. <laughs> you are one stupid nigger. You called, called a dumbass on national TV fucking money. BLM nigger. You should set an example for your people and go home, go back to your homeland of Africa. Oh, that's right. As a liberal, you are, an exam you are exempt from the bullshit ilk spout on a daily basis. I'm going to skip a few of these, and I'm going to come to this final one here. And this is on Twitter. So he says, or she says, he is the racist, and so are you. The woman on the phone is understandably fed up. Her opinions come from her observations and experiences. American blacks have been trained to be assholes by liberal whites, mostly by public education and media, run, both run by Jews. Blacks enjoy it. So the reason, the reason I read that now, some of you may know that I um, uh, made a couple of appearances on Fox News uh, with, with Tucker Carlson on Tucker Carlson Tonight. And you know, I know Tucker off camera, and he's, he's kind of a frat boy, you know, he comes in, oh, Professor Nichols, you know, that's just kind of his personality. But he is basically playing up the, the white nationalist angle uh, when he's on camera. And one of the reasons he does this is all because I, I personally believe that Tucker's way too smart to believe that stuff. He does this because this is what his audience wants, and he plays up to it. But I went on there uh, a couple times, and I, and I got a lot of uh, hateful responses. And people asked me a lot of times why I kept going back. You know, why are you going back? Don't you see the abuse that you're getting? And I can't lie to you that after I would get those responses, and I would get those emails, and I would get those voicemails, and all those kinds of things, I will tell you that for 24 hours, it, it affects you. You know what I mean? When you get called a nigger, 20, you know, for 24 straight hours uh, by all these people all over America, you know, and it's just constant, and they're on every medium, you know, we have so many different media here, so it's like Twitter, Facebook, email, voicemail, any way that they can contact you, you know, they're berating you with racial slurs and calling you an idiot and calling you all kinds of things it does affect you at a certain point. And when people are starting to make veiled threats at your life, and certainly veiled threats at your family's life, you know, and they're talking about, you know, wishing your whole family to die a horrible death, uh, it's scary and it is, it does emotionally affect you. Uh, however, one of the things that it also does is, is motiv it's motivated me. And I keep going back because I think that people with progressive politics have to be involved in every conversation in America. They cannot be speaking in their own little echo chambers. So one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight was, you know, uh, and it has to do with our own campus climate, is the difference between free speech and hate, and hate speech. Now we know around the world Many places around the world define free speech uh, differently than we do here in America. You know, uh, we have this kind of free speech absolutism. We think that all free, everything you say, you know, people will scream, free speech, I have the right to say this. Now, if you were to go to anywhere in the European Union, they have outlawed hate speech. If you were to go to Brazil, Racism is literally a crime. Now, that's not to say racism doesn't exist, you know, just like all crime, but it is a crime to be racist against another person. Uh, if you go to Germany, the most prosperous country, I mean, we seem to think 
that everything in America will fall apart if we start to put certain limits on free speech. We think that everything is just going to collapse. But Germany, the most prosperous country in the, Euro in the European Union, probably in all of Europe, uh, has limits. You cannot uh, go walk around with Nazi paraphernalia in Germany. You can't say the words Heil Hitler in Germany. Those, that is a crime. You know, you will be punished for that. Um, here in the United States, we seem to, uh, you know, the First Amendment covers most things, but it doesn't cover obscenity, doesn't cover child pornography, doesn't cover uh, defamation. There are many things uh, that are already limits on free speech. Uh, one of the things that I think also is that certain venues, you know, are allowed to put limits on your speech. Schools being one of them. Schools, the military, there are certain things in certain venues where you can't say anything you, it is that you want. And threats, by the way, are not uh, covered under the First Amendment of free speech. <clears throat> so here, how does this relate to us here at the University of Maryland? I think we've had this debate, I've had this discussion with a lot of people. One of the things that I, I think is important of course, any speech that incites violence, that the purpose is to incite violence, not that that's necessarily a, uh, a byproduct, but the purpose is to incite violence or talks about the annihilation of a group of people is not free speech. That's hate speech. And I think we have a responsibility here to limit that kind of speech. However, I still believe as an educator, I've been part of this community uh, for 22 years now. It's, it's been a long time that I've been a part of this community in some capacity. Uh, I met Dr. Lowe for the first time the other day and I asked him for a gold watch. Uh, he, he pulled out a, some, some plastic pin and was like, here you go. Uh, so I guess I, I'll take what I can get. But, uh, one of the things that I, I think that I've kind of vowed to as an educator is to believe in open dialogue. And I also believe in progressive politics and the arguments that we can make. And one of the reasons that I go on with Tucker and go on with other people, and go on with Armstrong Williams and go on with all of these conservative people uh, is because, you know, well, number one, I like the way I look on TV, but also, because I don't back down. I think my argument is strong enough, you know? And you would be surprised with all of those negative emails that, that I read you, there are many where people come out and they say, wow, Tucker lost tonight. Or wow, you really made an argument that made me think about this issue. So I think it's important for us, again, not to create even the university, which is one of the reasons I fell in love with the university uh, of Maryland and, and universities uh, in general is because of the free exchange of ideas. So I always give this example. If I have a student come into class and he's got, or he or she, has a Confederate flag shirt on, I don't want to tell that student, you can't wear that shirt in this classroom. I want to ask that student, why they're wearing the shirt, and then have a discussion where other students say why it offends them. That may not change anything, or, or it may, but one thing I know that won't change it, or at least the mentality that that person has behind it, is if I tell them they can't wear it. One of the things, you know, uh, even as a, as a child, you know, I think as children we develop many of the, the ideas that we have as adults, you know, and it really doesn't change. We just get more tactful in how we express them. Um, and one of the things I can remember in my childhood is when my parents told me I couldn't do something, you know, it made me want to do it more. I may not do it in their house, but I, you know, I found a friend's house to do that. And sometimes it was just about the rebellion. And one of the things about this kind of white nationalist movement, this, this uh, sexist anti-LGBT movement, 
that's going on right now that's that's led by you know people high up in our in our uh, in our government um, which you know I really liked hearing the Dean talk about talk about a black woman as uh, as madam president who knows maybe 2020 we'll see you know yeah I wasn't talking about you no I'm kidding I'm, a, I'm only kidding no 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 I you would have my vote immediately. Okay. You know, I, you would absolutely have my vote. Um, so, uh, but 2020, are you, are you that old? Are you 35? Don't you have to be 35? Uh, you have to be 35 by then. But anyway, anyway, as I was saying. I have no plans, no intention. Of okay. Running. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what they all say uh, at this stage. But, um, you know, one of the things about this movement uh, is that they are, they feed off of victimization. That's one of the things that they feed off of. I'm a victim. One, that's why they bring up Berkeley all the time. They're, they won't let me speak. They won't let this happen. You know, um, now I think, as I said, we can put conditions on speech. So if Ann Coulter wants to come to this campus, I personally don't want to block her from coming. I want to prove that my ideas are stronger. That would be, that would be my idea here, and I would say there are conditions. You know, Dr. Nichols has to moderate, you know? And, and you have to be open to those questions. And one of the things that I know about Ann Coulter, for example, uh, is that while they claim free speech, she has a list on her website of journalists that she won't let interview her, you know? So it's all about shutting down speech, shutting down ideas, but they want to make us seem hypocritical, you know? And so I, my personal belief is that if we believe in our ideas and we believe that our position is stronger, which I have no doubts, I have no doubts that if you put any of my colleagues up in a, in a debate with any of those people, now there are some people I will admit that I won't debate because I think even my presence would uh, validate them in some ways. You know, you're not going to get me on YouTube debating uh, Richard Spencer because he's not worthy of my time. And I think even if I destroy him and destroy his ideas, it validates him to say I debated a University of Maryland professor. You know, so he, he would love that. But I do think that I don't want to ban people's ideas from the classroom if a student comes in and wants to talk about it. I'm willing to engage that student. I'm willing to have that discussion. I'm willing for all of us with all the smart students that I have, and well-read students, I'm, I'm willing for, to, to facilitate a debate so that that student can get other ideas. You know, um, I'm not trying to shut down any kind of dialogue. I think it's important for us to, and for the universities around the country to maintain themselves as being open exchanges of ideas, you know? And the only people that, that hide are scared people, you know? So again, I think that it's okay to have limits on free speech, but I still believe that we still need to be uh, a, a bastion of, of ideas and, and being willing to, to engage and to discuss ideas and to sometimes shut down certain arguments with, with reason and logic and being uh, on, the, on the side of right. And I don't think those two things are, are mutually exclusive. I think we can accomplish both. So um, I guess that's pretty much my commentary. Okay, um, so I wanted just to thank Dr. Nichols again uh, for coming, not only my former professor, um, but last uh, semester, um, kind of these emails started coming in more heavily and more publicly. Um, a few of us saw that he got a voicemail. It was several minutes long, kind of along these same lines, just someone continuing. Um, so we definitely wanted to make sure that for, for all those reasons that we had this um, conversation. So I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Um, I do have uh, one to start, though. Um, so, obviously, it can't be easy to have all these like threats and hate uh, being directed towards you, especially by people 
you don't know um, and who don't know you, but you continue to speak out against them, you continue to make appearances. Um, do you think it's realistic and worthwhile for kind of everyone to be trying to change the minds of people who think this way, or are there other goals or other um, kind of things we should be shooting for? So, um, I don't know that, that my purpose is necessarily to change the minds, particularly change the minds of, of people that are, that are calling me a nigger and, you know, telling me my family needs to die and, and all of that. Um, I think that there are people out there, particularly if, if we're talking about, say, you know, Tucker Carlson tonight, that's the number one rated news show in the, in the country. And, you know, we can news with the bunny ears around it. But um, so I think that there are people out there uh, who perhaps are hearing these ideas and not hearing any opposition. And so I think it's important, like I said, for us to be, if we want to, our ideas about peace and justice and fairness and love to be the dominant ideas in America, we can't let 3.5 million people view the other side every single night, you know, without uh, our argument being interjected into that. Um, so, and sometimes I also think that it's not always bad when the wrong people get mad, you know, so it's not that I'm necessarily trying to provoke them, but, you know, if you're mad, that's, I think that's okay. I can live with that. Um, but my, my goal certainly is to make sure that no one with hateful ideas, uh, particularly with a mainstream platform, gets away with it without our ideas being there, being at least present. Thanks. And another question I had before I open it up um, is a lot of times after times of tragedy um, or other like big national events, the country will come together. Um, what are ways that we can maintain that unity uh, regardless of people's identities or regardless of their political leanings? Um, so, I would say um, unity, uh, you know, that we have, I, I'm, I'm not sure that we have any unity even now after, for example, after Parkland, um, because everybody has different ideas about this, you know, so I'm not so sure that we've ever had complete unity, uh, but I think one of the things uh, we have to do is to maintain as much civility in, in debate as, as we possibly can. Um, and it's hard when you have, you know, a leader who doesn't believe in civility and, you know, who, you know, tweets at 3 a.m. and, you know, yeah, he's almost, you know, it's funny, like, uh, one thing I gotta say, I am, I am a fan of President Trump because he thinks like, like a battle rapper. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, he's, he, you know, Always with the comebacks. Yeah, yeah, he will clap back. He doesn't let any disses slide. He will come after you, you know. Um, he's either, you know, a battle rapper or there's like a 14-year-old girl in East Baltimore who's running his Twitter right now. Like, what did Jilla Brand say? You know, going in with the Twitter fingers. Um, so I, I don't know that there's ever been a point. I think, you know, the, the dean pointed this out. I don't think there's ever been a point where we've been unified as a country. I think that's, that's our aspiration and goal. Um, and, you know, the hope is that we can have unifying leaders that, like, you will be in the future. Um, I think the, the goal is that we can unify around our basic principles. So, and, and that's what I try to bring, you know, to the debates. If you listen um, to, you know, the clips even on Fox News, what I always try to bring into the conversation is, you know, not about where we've been, necessarily, um, not even where we are, but who is it that we as Americans, and I would say as human beings, but certainly as Americans, who is it that we plan to be? What do we, wanna, what do we want our country to represent? Do we want it to represent exclusion? Uh, do we want it to represent hate? Do we want it to represent racism? Or do we want it to represent peace and love and, and, and justice? And so I try to bring that into any discussions you know, that we, that I have. Okay, now questions from the audience. Delisha. How did I know Delisha had a question? Yes. <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, 
So um, before we start, well, before we start, just say your name, what you're studying, and then uh, speak into the mic, please. Thank you, Theo. No one knows who Theo is. Um, so <laughs> I'm Delisha. Uh, Jason and I know each other. Unfortunately, I have also been on the end of people attacking Jason, but also attack me on Facebook. So it's a sensitive issue for me personally. Um, but what I get really irritated about is talking about these concepts as abstract ideals, like you just mentioned, like becoming a unified nation is an ideal. And I think it's very, thank you, Theo. It's very hard for people to, um, if we talk about, some, say, a word like systematic oppression or racialized systems and structures, I think it makes it hard for people to think about what can they do in their everyday existence to actually work to dismantle those structures. So my question for you is, and you don't have to get too specific if you don't want to, um, how do you see from a pros professorial role how faculty play a role in not sort of uh, being complicit in the racialized structures that exist at this university. Oh man, so I think, I think, the, oh, is, is it off or is it on? It doesn't matter. Um, okay, there we go. Um, he already said I'm a rapper, so I like to have a mic in my hand. Um, so, I think that there, there are many things we can do um, in order to, first of all, to not recreate, you know, do our best not to recreate these kinds of hierarchies. You know, one of the things that, I, that I've had to be conscious of and I've, I've become a lot more conscious of over the last year, even more than before, and I was, uh, you know, mentored, all of my mentors have been women. With the exception of the late Dr. Clyde Woods, all of my mentors have been women. And with the exception of all of those women, uh, all but one were women of color, you know. Um, but yet, I've become even more gender conscious uh, than I, and, and sexuality conscious than I have been in the past. So uh, I have to, you know, I think we have to be conscious of that when, when we're having course discussions. Um, we have to be conscious of, of uh, what it is, you know, whether people prefer certain pronouns or, or whatever it is in order to, to make a more inclusive environment. Like I said, I, I want an open, uh, you know, open dialogues and, and, you know, I try to always tell my students, the first thing I tell my students is this class has a bias. It reflects my biases and the biases of African American studies at the University of Maryland. Um, and all of your courses have biases. Public policy courses have biases. Uh, business courses have biases. Even your science courses have biases, with the exception of perhaps math, <laughs> might be the only subject where there's no bias. You know, um, But I tell them that I'm not going to grade them or score them based on how they parrot my ideas back to me. You know, uh, And it, they are also free to find other sources and, and to challenge. Uh, the ideas that I bring. So I, I think um, we have to have an, you know, an inclusive environment, but that doesn't mean letting you know, conversation go run wild. You know, I think you, know, you have to try to set up an environment where uh, you know, ideas are respected, but people have to, have to speak respectfully to everyone and not recreate the hierarchies that we have in society that we're trying to break down. And hopefully, from that experience in the classroom, people will bring that to other uh, segments of their lives. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, is the simplistic answer, and that is um, that we have to talk about the systems of, of, of oppression over and over and over again. And I think there's a space for that in just about every class you take, just like I said with the biases. You know, public policy, you have to, there's no way you can talk about public policy without talking about systems of oppression. It's impossible, you know? You have to talk about gender oppression. There, there are things on the, on the books right now, you know, um, regarding sexual assault. On the books right now, and people are trying to even change things to make it worse. Talking about a forcible rape, which I don't know what, you know, what's an unforceable rape? You know, please, somebody define that for me. Um, you know, and, and all of these different, 
uh, things that are, that are going on, there's no way you can talk about this void of talking about oppression and, and talking about, you know, uh, systems of domination. We'll take another question. There's a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, you. You talked about uh, that hate speech uh, cannot be permitted. And, um, but I think before we make something a crime, we need to be able to define it fairly well enough so that a, a person has a reasonable idea if they're stepping over that line or if they're not stepping over that line. Have you come across a definition that you think is reasonably um, defined enough that we that you would suggest we use it, or if not, is there a, what process would you recommend that we use to get to a reasonably bright line so we know when we're on one side or the other? So, when a, one thing of, about uh, hate speech, I would say um, that number one, I, even though I mentioned Brazil and I said that that racism is is, uh, is illegal there obviously they still have a race problem. So in a lot of ways, I think what they're doing is, is doing exactly what I'm talking about, saying you can't say that, but it doesn't necessarily, then sometimes it cuts off the dialogue because nobody says what they're thinking. And then it, it plays out in employment, you know, discrimination. It plays out in many other forms of, of discrimination against uh, you know, people of color in a country that has you know, the largest you know, African descended population outside of the continent of Africa. Um, so I think uh, the main thing that we have to do is if it is purposefully trying to incite violence. Now again, there are arguments, of course, people made arguments against the civil rights movement. You know, the argument against the civil rights movement was, oh, they're, gonna, they're trying to cause uh, uh, you know, a rabble rouse and cause a problem and cause violence. But when you're going and you are participating in civil disobedience, that's not trying to cause violence. That's, then the blame gets put on the side who's trying to be violent with you, you know? Um, so I think one of the things, if you are trying to start a fight, essentially, then um, I think that can be one example of you know hate speech if you're going out and saying you know screw you screw those people you know i hope they die whatever and you're literally trying to incite people into violence the night you're hanging all the time. yeah i i think that that's that's trying to intimidate people and that's not even protected under the first amendment now you know i think that that's actually a crime now if you are literally uh, focusing on one group, and again, like I said, talking about their annihilation, you know, um, you know, it, it, your your question is a good one because it, it reminds me of, I think it was 1977 in Skokie, Illinois. Is anybody familiar with this case? So if you're if you're you know a Chicago person, you probably have at least heard of this. And in Skokie, the uh, National Socialist Workers Party, whatever they, the Nazis call themselves. Uh, decided that they wanted to have a march uh, in Skokie. Now, one in six residents of Skokie, Illinois, was uh, either a direct Holocaust survivor or a relative of a Holocaust survivor. So that's one in six. I think it was, uh, I, I may be getting this wrong, but I think Skokie has had 70,000 people and 40,000 of them were Jews, you know, and yet, these, these people who called themselves Nazis and wore Nazi armbands and, you know, um, Nazi paraphernalia wanted to march through the streets, obviously for the purpose of intimidating people. But the ACLU fought on the side of the Nazis. And the reason being because, and this is, this is the danger, is that uh, the reason they fought on the side of the Nazis is because the Nazis... Uh, they didn't want a situation where unpopular views get, mar you know, get, uh, you know, thrown under the bus, you know, just because something is unpopular. And the, one of the reasons why I won't ban that Confederate flag T-shirt is because if I come on with a shirt with Malcolm X on the front, you know, you please believe they will try and use that against me, you know. 
And if you know me, you know I wear T-shirts all the time. I, I need for the, for the dean to take me shopping because he's, <laughs> he's looking pretty sharp tonight. Um, but again, if I, if I wear a Malcolm X T-shirt, if, you know, if I have a lecture about the Black Panther Party and, and, and talk about you know, their, you know, things that they changed in healthcare and childcare and feeding the community, and you know, someone comes and tries to misconstrue my words and, and change that, they're, please believe they're gonna use it against us. And this is what they're trying to do right now. You know, uh, the, the alt-right and all these people, one of the things, one of those emails that I read you, uh, believe it or not, where the guy was talking about civil war, he actually wrote that and copied uh, two assistants to the president of the university. You know, they, and, and as many calls as I get, you know, my boss at, at the university gets calls about me because somebody saw me on TV. So again, one of the things that they want to do is marginalize, you know, people like me, people with my ideas, people probably like many of you is to try to challenge you and, and any way that they can get you out using your own ideas against you, you know, about trying to, you know, limit ideas and limit speech, they're gonna try and use that against you. So that's why I say don't give them the, the armor in order to do that, you know. Uh, I met, you know, um, oddly enough, it was funny, I, I was on, you know, Armstrong Williams show and I met a guy named Charlie Kirk does anybody know who he is? He's, uh, he's, on, he's got his own organization. He's a young kid. He's only like 24, 25. He's got his organization called Turning Points USA. And they are basically an alt-right organization. I'd never heard of him. I was, I got him out. I was taking a selfie. And all of a sudden, he gets in the background and like smiles over my shoulder. I'm like, who is this guy? And, you know, I, I posted the picture, and people were like, is that Charlie Kirk? Is that Charlie Kirk? And what they're doing right now is they're trying to be involved in student elections, SGA elections. So it's not just that they're trying to, to think about, you know, bigger, you know, uh, who's in Congress. They want to change the fabric and the environment that you have here on college campuses. The first thing they want to do is get rid of people like me and people like other people in African American studies, then get rid of African American studies and get rid of all cultural studies. And, um, you know, then they wanna, you know, I was, I was uh, hearing one person talking about uh, how they were upset that a lot of economists around the country are using Karl Marx. How do you talk about, you know, <laughs> economics Without, without talking about Capital and without talking about Karl Marx and Engels. You know what I mean? Even if you're not necessarily endorsing it, you have to read it, you know? So the, I think we're a step away from burning books. You know, I, really, and I, and I think that that's really dangerous for our society, particularly if we're talking about free speech. So they, they hold the free speech mantle, but it's all a ruse. The idea is really limiting speech limiting ideas, getting rid of books, not allowing you to see certain things, because they want to, you know, have a bunch of Charlie Kirks in the future. They think we are, you know, we're socializing you. When I told you, in my class, first thing I do, admit I have a bias, admit the class has a bias, and tell them that they will not be graded on their ideas, their opinions, they'll be graded on their ability to support it. You know, um, so I think, you know, while we're trying to be open, they want to close this off. You know, so I think we can't, we have to battle them actually by being open to their arguments and destroying them. Thanks. I have a question in the back here. Hi, my name's Jasmine. I'm an undergrad. I'm double majoring in African American Studies and Criminal Justice and I'm a minor in law and society. And, <laughs> and one of the things that I notice on campus is that I'm a really big student activist, so there's a lot of town halls and demonstrations and protests that we hold, but when it comes to like administration, there's this big stressor of 
diversity and inclusion, but they kind of missed the inclusion part. So one of the questions I'm asking is how can we hold our teachers more accountable to being inclusive? Because there's often times in my criminal justice classes where there's topics that people are like really sensitive about and they have strong opinions about, but the teachers don't really know how to moderate those conversations. So instead they kind of brush them off. And because of that, it kind of a repetitive cycle of that happening. So how can we, one, educate our teachers to like learn how to hold these conversations, but also make it comfortable for like students to actually speak up on, in classrooms because when you get shut down, you're kind of like, I, I can't really say anything else anymore. Right. So um, in my answer to this, I'm gonna give a shout out to Jasmine Braxton. Um, she is, is the president of an organization called Community Roots. And what they do is take education into their own hands, which I think is really important. Is, you know, if you're not getting certain things from the criminal justice department, from African American studies, from any department, one of the things they do is arm themselves with knowledge and hold essentially, you know, if anybody here is, is older during the, um, during the Vietnam War, they used to have what they called, you know, uh, people had sit-ins, they had teaching. And they would even invite their professors to come and give lectures, and they would invite the community. I've tried to pitch this, this idea actually to, uh, to student activists, you know, saying, hey, we can have an overnight teaching, you know, and get your faculty members to come in and teach a lecture, maybe a lecture that they wouldn't normally teach, you know. And not only that, but students also be prepared and come in and give the lectures. That's also a way of tearing down some of these hierarchies. If you are knowledgeable about a subject, it doesn't matter what letters you have behind your name. You know, I'll tell you right now, my grandfather, uh, military veteran, you know, was poor, grew up in the deep south, but could, you know, out lecture, out debate, you know, we could put him in religious studies, he'd destroy all of those people because he knew the Bible backward and forward. You know, he, you know, he knew, you know, current events. He read like four newspapers a day. Like that was just the kind of man he was. He was thirsty for knowledge. And so I think it'd be good to, to set up those kinds of uh, teaching where the community is, is able to come through. You don't have to pay the $20,000 a year uh, to come here. And, you know, you invite community activists, you invite other people to, to educate people. So one of the things I would say is sometimes I think we put too much uh, of education into the hands of professors. Um, I mean, this, of course, this is what we get paid to do, but I think if, if your professors aren't uh, educating completely in the, in the ways that you want to be educated, then do what Jasmine and her organization do, which is bring people together, you know, they hold a lecture and then they have a discussion you know, at their general body meetings. And I think that that's a, that's a great idea. And like I said, if anybody wants to do a teaching, you know, I'll bring my pajamas. <laughs> I, you know, I'll come in my pajamas and I will be ready. And my pajamas are sometimes better than my regular clothes. Thanks, we had one over here. Hi. Um, I'm Sydney. I'm an undergraduate public policy major. Hey, guys. Um, nice. um, I had a question because we're talking a lot about education and like education policy is my thing. So, um, but when we talk about education and like the marketplace of ideas and all that, I realize that the conversation when we talk about diversity and inclusion hinges a lot on white centrality and white fragility and how we can best accommodate white people and how we can best get to the people who are active, not actively trying to undermine us, but like in terms of like white nationalists, it's like how can we best have a conversation with you and not how can you do better for us? Because it really puts the responsibility on the people who have been oppressed to undo their own oppression. And in that sense, I feel like when you set up that structure, the the hierarchy is still in power. So like, how do we, it's not like how do we stop being mammies, but like that's the only thing that's coming to my yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, how, how do we stop being what? Say mammies, Mam like Mam teaching yeah. and educating and coddling oh, okay. when I'm, they also need to be willing to do the work because I know a lot of people who 
are willing to do the work and are white. And that's great, but that's all of our white friends. Yeah, <laughs> because if not, we would not be friends. But um, how do we create a space that centralizes brown voices, queer voices, disabled voices, and doesn't necessarily still create that imbalance of power where the privileged person is the central? Okay, so that's actually a really good question. And it, it reminds me of a lot of conversations that I have with one of my colleagues, um, uh, Robert Shaflet in, uh, in African American Studies. And, and he's, he's a white gentleman, I know. Yeah, that's, that's Delicious dude right there. <laughs> and he, um, one of the conversations that we always have is that in part, not completely, you know, um, but in part, the the rise of this of this alt right movement is a is a reflection of failures of the white left. The white stop reaching out to a lot of people, you know, stop reaching out to uh, particularly and and not even necessarily the alt right movement because they're kind of like preppy, you know, they're just preppy racists. But particularly when you were to go into somewhere like Eastern Kentucky where you know, 98% for Donald Trump and all of that. Um, it's a, and, and some of the, the, the Rust Belt and, and areas like that, it is a failure of the white left to reach those people. They got snooty, they came into academia, they stopped going into unions, they stopped going in and talking to their, to their own people you know, uh, in some of those environments and reaching out to them. And I agree with you, it is their responsibility. It is the responsibility of progressive whites to go in and educate, you know, uh, other whites, you know, about white supremacy. I think it's the same thing. This is why I've tried to call um, meetings of men because it is the responsibility of men to undo patriarchy. You know what I mean? And, and you know, I, I've, I've said that uh, from the very beginning that, you know, in trying to get together young men and, and you know, we had a conversation in my, in my intro class about uh, about the Aziz Ansari situation, you know, and it was a hard conversation, and it was, and you know, I think it was good because number one, men listen to each other, and men listen to women, you know, um, and I thought it was really good, but it's not the it's not women's responsibility; it's men, and and progressive-minded men need to go out uh, first, get educated, and then go out and reach out to other men and put you know, put a certain amount of pressure on them as well. So um, I'm, I'm definitely in, in agreement about that. And um, the, the second part, your question was, like, how, how do we go about that? Thank you. Um, so when we al not allow white people to become our spokesperson, but like mm -hmm. in a lot of instances, our voices get diminished because that's their go-to white person's like, how, what do we do about the blacks? That, <laughs> cent that central white person. Yeah. And like, although those people are appreciated, but like we need, it's not that we, c we can do so much to get into those spaces, but like being barred from those spaces is definitely a thing. So I think uplifting those voices would be a very important thing to do, because in a lot of settings, our voices are only uplifted when we're all together. And I don't think that that does enough. Right, well, I, I think um, it's important to maintain the idea that our voices are important and that our voices must be uplifted and not even have a white spokesperson, you know, People have asked me, and I know this is probably on tape, I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, again, you, you got me in a hip-hop frame of mind, so, you know, I'm going to turn 50 Cent and start calling people out and all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, I've, I've had people ask me how I feel about someone like Tim Wise. And to me, you know, I agree with everything he says. There's nothing that he says that I don't agree with. But um, I really think one of the problems with him is he doesn't have any original thoughts. And the idea is, you know, number one, he gets promoted by, by black folks saying, this is the guy that white people need to hear. 
but his audiences oftentimes are still black. And then it also still furthers this idea that, you know, when I say it, it's not important, you know? So, you know, when someone else says it, it's not important. When I was talking about white voices going into white communities, it wasn't going, you know, to, to big, give big lectures and get paid, you know, $15,000 a lecture. You know, I mean, that's cool too, but I think the big thing was for them to go into the community organizations, to go into the unions, to do that kind of grunt work. You know, that, that's what I was talking about. Um, I think, hopefully, we get to a point where progressive-minded people or open-minded people will listen to black people talk about their own experiences and not have to have a white guy that comes along or somebody that looks like them and hopefully we can get to a point, like I said, I'll have the meetings, you know, the, the small meetings with men and, and talk to them, and particularly, you know, cishet men and, and, and talk to them about the privileges that we have. But when we're in some of those larger spaces, I think it's important to have the voices of the actual people, you know, the, the, the low-income transgender black woman be able to speak for herself and to her own experiences and not have to have me come along and validate it, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, we don't need to uplift their, their voices. They need to go into their small spaces. They need to, like, sometimes be the guy who calls out, you know, the half-drunk uncle at, at Thanksgiving. That's what we need, you know, from, from you. We don't, we don't need you to be the big public intellectual and, you know, in many ways, um, in some ways, uh, I, I was having a conversation. It's a little not fair to Tim Wise, but I was like, Tim Wise, in many ways, is like the white Paris Denard. And the reason I said that, you guys don't know who Paris Denard is? Oh, he's, he's, a, he's a conservative, black conservative talking head. But anyway, the, the point being is that when Paris Denard goes on, just like that pastor who wrote me, you know, White people say, that's what black people need to hear. He's the one that black people need to hear. And then when uh, Tim Wise is on, black people say, this is the guy that white people need to hear. You know? But in reality, Paris Denard is not talking to black people. Black people don't pay him any attention. There's mad black people in here, and nobody knew who he was. <laughs> I was the only one, or me and Delisha. You know? And, and you know, but um, so I think it's important um, that we, we don't have to promote those voices. Those voices need to promote, promote themselves and, and be willing to go into some of those communities, go into Eastern Kentucky. I guarantee you Tim Wise is not taking no, you know, you know, plane ticket and motel room to go and speak to people in Eastern Kentucky. I guarantee it. You know, that's not what he's going to do. Um, and I could be wrong. If, if I'm wrong, Tim Wise, forgive me, <laughs> you know, but that's probably not going to happen. And I think we need more of those, those people who are willing to do that work, you know, uh, than, than the big, necessarily the big voices. Thanks. And actually that kind of reminds me of allyship within all our communities. Um, the white black dynamic is I think the, the main one that a lot of times we talk about. Um, but even even us who are in marginalized communities, remembering to to also call out people in our own communities for for attacking others. Um, I think we can take like two, three more questions. There were some over here before. Well, actually, I have one that got um, the kind of what I thought of when you asked the question is if you could talk about the importance of ethnic studies. Um, as an African-American studies professor, and then just more generally? Um, <clears throat> so I think it's, you know, incredibly important um, because one of the things, you know, it kind of reminds me of the old debate that people used to have when they would say, you know, why do you say you're African-American? Why can't you just be American, you know? Um, and, you know, I would usually pose that question back to, why, why can't I? You tell me. But, um, but at the same time, I think what people say, and it, and it goes back to what Du Bois was talking about in, in 1903, uh, when people say American, 
they mean a flood of white Americanism. They mean forgetting any kind of, you know, your cultural identity or, or anything like that. And when you do that, that means doing what the people in those emails wanted me to do. Not talk about race and not, and by extension, not talk about racism. You know, not talk about, you know, if you don't talk about race, don't talk about gender. And if you're not going to talk about gender, certainly don't talk about sexism. You know, somehow that that's uh, against unity and that's unpatriotic and, and all those things. And I think cultural studies are important because in ethnic studies, uh, because they bring in a, a lot of these discussions that aren't being had in the history department. You know, that aren't being had in, in other departments around, you know, different campuses. Uh, of course, they're being had in, in, in public policy, right? <laughs> you know, but, you know, African American studies, you know, uh, and theoretically, theoretically, you know, uh, cultural studies are also supposed to be interdisciplinary, a place where you can find you know, experts in many different fields that their, their knowledge is, uh, is focused in, in uh, you know, one area in African Americans with, you know, in terms of economics and African Americans in terms of family studies and African Americans in terms of history. And I think that that's a beautiful thing to have that kind of center and, to, and you know, to use probably an overused term to be unapologetically you know, black and unapologetically Latino and unapologetically uh, Asian American to have those conversations and to be leaders in, the, in those conversations because they will get marginalized or you will have, you know, um, you know, a history department with, you know, 50 tenured faculty members, you know, and then they'll hire one guy who does race sometimes. You know what I mean? So I think it's important to, to understand that you know, race and racialization in our country is, is, is something that has been part of our fabric since before we were a country. You know, since this, you know, 1619, you know, people came to, you know, this land and were of a different status on the basis of where they came from and, and on the color of their skin. And so if we're going to sit there and have a, you know, a glaring blind spot in terms of that, I think we're doing education a disservice. And like, we, like I said, you know, the beauty of a university, which is an African concept, the beauty of a university is that it's a center for learning. You know? And if we're going to learn about who we are, particularly as a nation, we can't avoid race. We can't avoid gender. We can't avoid sexuality, because that's who we are um, in this country and, and worldwide. Question back here. Um, I think going back to what Corinne said about like the black community in general, how can you foster conversations among black people more? For example, I'm Nigerian. When I came here, people see me as African American or black without hearing me talk and knowing my story. So in a sense, they impose these ideas about being black on me without talking to me. And I don't know if you've read um, Americana by Chimamanda Diche. She talks about how you don't know you're black until you come to America. People don't perceive you as black. Your reality is post-colonial in a sense, and you're seen as tribal, your ethnic group, whatever. But you come to America, and now you have to act black in a sense. Sometimes the African-American community accepts you. Sometimes they don't see you as black enough because some of your ideas are considered white, or some of your attitudes to education or other things are seen as not being black enough. So how can you foster conversations among people from different parts of the black community who come to America? Um, so a couple of things. Um, number one, I'm going to take that comment or that, that question um, as an opportunity to talk about something that I think doesn't get talked about enough, and that is black Im immigrants and immigration. Um, I think that that is something that in uh, many of the, the discussions we've had about Black Lives Matter that has been forgotten. Um, we have over 500,000 undocumented black people, non-Latino non black people. If you include the Latino blacks, it gets even bigger. You know, um, 
So we have that, and yet this always gets framed outside. These issues of immigration get framed outside of being black issues. And I think it's somewhere way that we can find um, coalitions, since we're talking about strengthening our community, that's somewhere where, you know, the, the, uh, the black community and Latino communities can come together and say, look, we have an, we're part of this immigrant conversation too. Um, also, you know, I talked about Du Bois and, and I'm a believer in Du Bois and Garvey, even though they had some, some disagreements. Um, and, but, you know, I'm a believer in Pan-Africanism. And uh, yes, your experiences are different, but one thing we all have in common, and it reminds me of this discussion that I had with uh, this one student I had who was from Nigeria, and she was just sweet as pie, just the sweetest, uh, you know, little student I, I, I can remember. And um, one of the things that she said to me during the discussion, and uh, Corrine will probably remember this because I talk about this a lot, Jasmine will probably remember. Um, she said, you know, in her Nigerian accent, um, you know, uh, if you replaced all of the African Americans in this country with Nigerians, you wouldn't have half of these problems that you talk about in this classroom, you know? And so my response, you know, was, what the hell? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, my, my response was simple. And I was like, so what's up with Nigeria? What's up with the north of Nigeria and, and, you know, the issues that they're having there? You know, what's up with Boko Haram and, and some of the issues that, that the country is having and the corruption and billions of dollars disappearing? And, and one of the most, you know, uh, prosperous countries in Africa, you still have all these issues. And she was quick to be like, well, colonialism. And I said, aha. Okay. So now we're getting somewhere. So what do you think the issues with African Americans are? It's internal colonialism. Same thing, and, and I always try to tell them that, you know, my classes, I'm always like, look, this is a case study in colonialism. You can take African Americans out in a lot of cases and put Native Americans in who, you know, the, uh, uh, the ghetto, you know, you go to West Baltimore, you can go to Southeast DC, it's nothing but a reservation. It's what it is, you know? And say, you will have a lot of the same issues if you, you know, you can see them if you went to an Indian reservation right now, you know? So I think it's important uh, for us to, to talk about colonialism and how it affects all of us as something that unites us. Is it, you know, are, are there certain differences? Sure. Your accent is gonna be different than mine. You know what I mean? You're gonna, eat certain foods that I don't eat, even though there are probably some similarities. You know, you're gonna, you know, listen to different music than I uh, do. But, you know, there's no, you know, blackness is not a monolith, and this is one of the reasons why we need cultural studies, is because people need to understand that there are so many black experiences. You know, and I, and I would also tell you, um, just to promote my department a little bit, we also are, are trying to come up with a, um, an African studies minor. So if you want to learn more about the continent itself, um, because, you know, African Americans, we are a branch off the tree. Um, but, you know, we all know that, that the, the tree's roots and, and trunk are in Africa. So I think it's important for us to have those discussions. And I, and I also will say that, you know, how many people saw Black Panther? All right, we can all throw up our little, you know. <laughs> But, I, you know, I think that that's important because, you know, for so many generations, you know, uh, I think some of the, the discord that, that you're referring to came from this idea that Africa was something you were supposed to be ashamed of. And so even though this is a fictional country in Africa um, and looking at where it's fictionally located, African Americans wouldn't even descend from that part of Africa for the most part. <laughs> You know, um, but still, you see all this pride from African Americans in in this idea that you know um, Africa, you know, there there's something 
strong and positive, and there was an image of Africa that wasn't uh, poverty and corruption and starvation. And I think that one of the things now, since we're, we're at a really important historical moment, is this could be a jumping off point to have conversations about what it is we have in common, you know? Um, and like I said, you know, I think this, you know, like Black Panther can be one for, for continental African communities and African Americans. I think immigration can be one for African people and, you know, broadly defined and Latino people. Um, I think that there's so many opportunities where we can have these conversations and find out what we have in common, which is our basic humanity. If anybody, you know, people have asked me, I even did an interview uh, Monday where a guy asked me about the, the, the voicemail that some of you may have seen. And, you know, the one thing that upset me about that whole voicemail, sometimes, I mean, I even cracked a smile during it. I was like, oh, here we go again. But the one thing that, that kind of, you know, disturbed me was there's a part in it. Um, because let's be honest, she only talks about me for about 10 seconds. And then it's just black people in general. You know, but there's one part where she says, you're not even human. And I got to say, that affected me. Like I was, if there was anything, you know, look, I've been, look I'm from Maryland. I'm black. I've been called a nigger before. You know what I mean? Like, you know, not that I love it, but it's happened. You know what I mean? Um, but when she said, you're not even human, you know, taking away my basic humanity, she couldn't, she looked at her TV screen and she didn't see this handsome face, you know? <laughs> Kidding. But, you know, she, did, she didn't see, you know, my hair, my skin, my mouth, my nose, you know, and, and all of the things that make me human, you know. Um, and so one of the things that I think is, is my mission is, is really to, uh, for, to try to forge uh, unity on people based on our humanity. That's the best way I think I can think of challenging people trying to strip other people of their humanity, is trying to explain what it is that we have in common, which is our humanity. Yeah, I think that's a really key uh, point because a lot of times we talk about like diversity and inclusion as boxes that we have to check off or like quotas that we have to fill. But at the end of the day, it's, this is really saying that you know I, despite our identities, like we all have kind of the same dignity and, and the same like humanity and, and we should all have the same ability to be here. Um, so I think we have one more question in the back. Mm -hmm. Give it a mic, Theo. Yeah. <laughs> like, look, give it Hi, a mic. Um, I'm Amber Zhang Ying from China. So I'm working with uh, Change Academy Mac in the e Acceleration Relationship Office. So um, my question is about, as an international student, I'm also thinking about how can we include, also create a more inclusive community for international students. Um, and also, so when facing with the situation of when you're not treating as, a, as what they are, like say, you are you and we are we, and then even, even treat us not as a human being, uh, how did you find your strength? Um, like, how did you find your chance to be confident again and then just find your own identity? And secondly is how you make your voice stronger, how you develop your own strength. Um, to, it's not like to, to try to persuade others, but try to uh, at least not fail yourself. Thank you. Um, so I would say, um, you know, well, as far as you know, people trying to, to strip away, you know, my humanity. You know, one of the things that I'm reminded of is, um, you know, my own personal history and the history of my people. Um, you know, uh, when you look at the fact that, like I said, 1619, um, the people who arrived on these shores had their humanity stripped. Um, you look at, you know, the civil rights movement and many other moments throughout our history, you know, they've had our, their humanity stripped, but they maintained it. And, you know, when Dr. King was killed, 
you know, he was leading, you know, uh, marches for, for sanitation workers and, and, you know, other important workers around. And they were holding signs. And those signs said, I am a man, you know. And I think, you know, that wasn't, that was in response to many different things because, of course, one of the ways to, to strip our humanity uh, as, as black people was, you know, to you were a perpetual boy or a girl. You know, it didn't matter how old you are. This is why I think it's important. I know some of you are of a different generation, but I'm going to put you up on game. When you talk to older black people, you know, call them Miss So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so. You know, I think that's important. You know, and that's a cultural thing, too, for African Americans. Um, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, if there's, if you're friends with, you know, one of the, you know, the maintenance people or something like that, make sure that you address them with respect. Um, because for a long time, people like, you know, older African American people were not treated with that same respect. Um, so when I think about that, and I think about, you know, people even now, in certain communities who aren't treated, you know, the way that they should be. Uh, I feel like it's important, you know, that we can't lose our voices. You know, like, it's not even necessarily that, you know, you know, I, I think I'm being so strong. I think it's more about, like, it's kind of my responsibility. You know, um, that was the responsibility that was passed down to me. And, I, you know, I, I can recall... Um, at a Thanksgiving with, with my family. And, you know, I asked my, at the time, he, he died uh, at a, he was 108 years old, my, my Uncle Charlie. And I'll tell you one quick story about Uncle Charlie. I promise I won't go on too long. But Uncle Charlie, this was many, many years ago. He was about probably 85 at the time. And everyone was getting food. Uh, you know, all the men were getting all kinds of food, and there was all kinds of macaroni and cheese and everything. And Uncle Charlie just had a uh, plate of black olives. And so he's eating these black olives. And then somebody finally asked him, like, why are you, Charlie, why do you just have those, those uh, black olives? And he looked up with a serious face and said, at 85 years old, uh, because they improve your sexual performance. You know, and, and this was an 85-year-old man. This was pre the little blue pill. So, you know, uh, Uncle Charlie was was a was a strong man. But that was a, that was a side story. That wasn't the main story. You know, it's just something that I think of whenever I think of Uncle Charlie. But I asked him on this other Thanksgiving when he was closer to 108. I asked him. I said, "Do you remember segregation?" And he was like, yeah, I remember segregation. And then my aunt, who was around 80 at the time, uh, said, I remember segregation. And then my dad, who was probably 60 at the time, said, I remember segregation. He remembers as a child going to a burger stand with his father and his father being furious because they would not serve them right here in our neighboring state of Virginia. So I think it's, it's my responsibility and it's your responsibility not to let your voice be taken and to be intimidated. There were all kinds of efforts that have been made throughout our history to limit people's voices. And, you know, I know you, you were saying you're from China, but if you look at the history of Chinese Americans, and other Asian Americans, and how their voices have been marginalized and have been taken, you know. Um, and some of the reasons we have, or you know, if you want to really trace back about the war on drugs, which African Americans have been really concerned with, dates back to racist ideas about Chinese people, you know. Um, and of course, in this country, we have a shameful history of, of interning, or, you know, we call them internment camps, we should just call them concentration camps, that we had right here in this country for Japanese Americans. And these were Americans. You know, these weren't even Japanese nationals. You know, Japanese Americans. So, you know, I think it's important 
you know, that number one, speaking about that, this, is, this shows where our histories intersect. You know, the war on drugs and the way, you know, its roots being in anti-Chinese uh, racism and then affecting African-Americans. That means that we need to speak up for one another. I need to be there for the Asian American community, you know, and, and the international student community. You know, I, and I think at the same time, we can look at, at many cases where just because it's right, they've asked, you know, they used to ask Dr. King, why do you do this? Because it's right, you know, and he stood up for the farm workers and, and you know, communicated with, with Cesar Chavez. None of these movements occur in a vacuum. So I think it's important that you guys are together, build coalitions. Don't, again, like I said, don't just speak in your silos. And that's not just, you know, not being afraid to engage people on the right or people who are hateful or anything like that. That's also about, hey, we need to, you know, we need to go uh, as, the, as the black student union and go talk to the Caribbean student union. And the Caribbean student union needs to talk to the Asian American student union. And the Asian American Student Union needs to talk to international students, you know, and, and you guys need to truly build a community. You're not a community if you don't dialogue amongst one another. So I think that that's really important and look out for one another. And so I think it's important if you hear, you know, something is, is uh, going, you know, uh, against a particular community, we all have to be there. I remember there was a, a situation here on campus um, where there was a, a group that had some anti-Asian lyrics. And the Asian and Asian American community stepped up and they said, we're gonna protest this. And I'm ashamed of the fact that many of the other groups on campus, including me, didn't get involved and back that community, you know? There are many, there, you know, I, I love, like I said, I've been here for a long time, um, 22 years coming up in the fall, and I can say there are only a few moments where I can say I, I, I'm ashamed of. And, you know, I wasn't, I don't know that I was part of any organization, but I, I should have I been standing out there with, with them. And, you know, this, you know, rock group sat there and they were on stage and they had the whole crowd, of course, you know, like when you have a microphone, you have the whole crowd, and they had the whole crowd giving these Asian American students the finger and yelling at them and all of that, right there on the mall. And I'm, I'm ashamed that I wasn't there standing there with them in solidarity, you know, um, because, you know, number one, it's the right thing to do, and number two, I'm next. You know, so there's no question about that. So there is an element of self-interest in it as well. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of how do you keep from losing your voice, um, I would just say you can't afford to lose it. You have to, you have to have it. You have to use it. And I love the confidence with you ran over to Theo and snatched the mic from Theo. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the way it should go down. Thank you. So I think. Uh, ending that on remembering to be strong in our voices and to support each other in our communities is a, is a good way to end it. Um, so thank you all again for coming. Um, thank you to Dr. Nichols. Yeah. Uh, the dean will have a few words. I just want to say one word here at the end. Um, I think we were treated tonight to what a public intellectual sounds like, but also what a public intellectual looks like. And the intellectual part, I'm not worried about when you put your ideas up against Tucker Carlson, poor Tucker Carlson. <laughs> but I wanted to focus just a second on the public part, because why we invited you tonight. You talked a lot about African American studies and the value and the power of studying and immersing yourself in the culture and the identity. In public policy, we're a discipline that was created to be technocratic. We'll turn dials, we'll get the right laws, the right policies, and good things will happen. 
but we all know that's not the way it always works out. In fact, it never has worked out. And so I think we are challenged in the public policy field to start incorporating ways of thinking about public policy that really includes the public. And that includes all of the public, and it includes the identities of the public. And so you, you really helped us on both the intellectual side tonight, but also the public side. And I want to thank you for that. I want to thank Corrine and Alicia and the others who instigated this idea uh, to bring you. You've treated us to a good, thought-provoking uh, discussion tonight. I want to keep it going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And one last invitation to everybody. We have a community pledge that I would like to uh, invite uh, anyone who feels comfortable to uh, sign. Uh, Dr. Nichols just said something near the end about a community, you have to dialogue with each other, but you also have to stand with each other. We are about community, and we have to build it every single day. So a pledge is just one small way to get us thinking about the fact we are one community and we have to stand with each other. So uh, thank you to uh, both Dr. Nichols, to Madam President. Wait, I, I want to know when you are 35, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll figure out when, when that election will be. <laughs> we'll get you there. Um, thank you so much. And Meg, could you bring those out? I want to now. You both get one because you both were part of showing us what public intellectuals look like. Thank you. Thank you so much.